Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about the uh, free salt exploration in the Santos Basin. Um, to start with, I'm just going to give you an overview of the location of the basin and the uh, exploration uh, that's occurred to date. Uh, so as we can see, uh, off the southeastern coast of <coughs> Brazil, uh, running from the coastline to the 3,000 meter isobar. Uh, here we have the CGG uh, survey coverage. Uh, I'll draw your attention to the Lula field here, uh, as much of the talk today is going to be focused around this particular area. Uh, we can see the extensive coverage uh, up in towards the campus in the north. Uh, so as I say, here's the Lula field. Um, the main area I'll be focusing on today is the cluster and cluster extension survey, uh, with a brief look at phase 6A, um, which is where we see the Libra discovery, which is a particularly exciting one uh, at AMP at the moment. Um, so I'm not sure you uh, consider the pre-salt of the Santos Basin to be uh, mature as such, as there's only two fields on stream at the moment. Uh, we've got lots of proven discoveries under appraisal, uh, but at present just the two fields in the pre-salt. Uh, this area here is part of the uh, outer high of the Santos Basin, which is something I'll be alluding to throughout the, uh, the talk. Um, they're separated here by the Curitiba transfer fault. In the north, we have the two-piece sub-high, uh, in which we find the Lula Field, uh, which was initially known as the uh, Tupi Field, uh, renamed after President Lula, uh, one of the most popular present, uh, presidents in, uh, in modern times. And then to the south of the transfer fort, we have the Sugarloaf High, um, which contains the Supima Field, um, which I should mention is about 2.1 billion barrels of oil that's recoverable, and Lula, about 6.5 billion barrels. Uh, so just to elaborate on that, as I say, uh, we have Sapinwa, which is just here, and Guarasul here uh, was previously thought to be in connection with this when it was first drilled, uh, but I'll get back to that later on. Uh, so just so you can see the, the Lula field here, which is probably the, the prize discovery of the area and really opened up uh, the pre-salt as an emerging uh, uh, play, uh, production beginning there in 2009. So here... Uh, I've sort of tried to give you a quick synthesis of the, uh, the fields that are most likely to come <coughs> onto production in the next few years. Uh, the DOC that I mentioned here is uh, the Declaration of Commerciality. Uh, we're expecting a few to come on in the next <coughs> few years. Um, one of the most exciting, as I mentioned, is the Libra discovery. Uh, it's only had one well drilled there so far, uh, but with th over 320 metres of net pay, uh, you can see why people might be getting quite excited about it. Uh, to the south of that, we have Franco uh, with a 438-metre column of oil, uh, which was uh, the last well of which was drilled in 2002. I believe that's still under appraisal at the moment. Uh, we have Ayara to the south, uh, which is this one here. Sorry, I should just mention that this is uh, the outline of Libra just here, and this is Franco. Uh, this is Ayara. Uh, the last well um, result literally came in in the last 10 days or so. Uh, there's a declaration of commerciality that's expected in December of this year. Um, and then over here, we have the Karkara discovery. Uh, the well results were announced right at the start of this year uh, with a 471-metre column of oil. And then down here, we have the Karamba uh, discovery, which was first drilled in 2007. Uh, the Karamba Sul well is uh, due to be drilled later this year uh, as an appraisal well. This slide here is just to give you a sort of overview of just how many prospects um, there are in the area. Uh, the ones I'm showing you here are the ones that have actually been drilled. So as I mentioned earlier, we have the Guara Sul, which is just here. Um, and then we have several other uh, discoveries that have been drilled, but undrilled, such as uh, Parova, which is just over here, uh, which is quite highly regarded, apparently, by Petrobras. Um, <coughs> two of the highlights, I suppose, would be the, the Carioca, uh, with an 83-metre uh, column of good quality oil, and uh, the Guara Sul, as I say, uh, which is reported to be a highly productive reservoir uh, with 93 metre oil column. Uh, so now I'm just going to give you a very, very brief overview into the, uh, the Brazilian oil industry. Um, we could spend weeks on this, so I'll try and keep it as, as brief as I possibly can. I apologise for the volume of text, but there is an unbelievable amount of stuff you can talk about here. Uh, just to introduce Petrobras, uh, the, the Brazilian government is the majority shareholder here. Uh, which means that in the pre-salt, uh, Petrobras <coughs> is the only operator and will have a minimum of 30% participation in each block. 
Uh, under the transfer of rights agreement, which was a deal made between Petrobras and the government, uh, they purchased uh, the production of 5 billion barrels of oil in certain blocks of the pre-salt uh, for around $42 billion. Now these areas of the pre-salt are tied in, so until uh, they reach this 5 billion barrels of oil, um, they essentially belong to Petrobras. Uh, the debt position of Petrobras is the largest of any publicly traded oil company. Uh, in April, it was in a US uh, de dollar denominated uh, $96 billion. Although I read something yesterday which had the estimate somewhere around $72 billion, um, which has led to some reports that suggest that some larger operators are uh, looking at the pre-salt for potential operatorship. Uh, there's two things I'd just like to mention here. Uh, first, that Petrobras... Um, have, um, well, the government of Brazil uh, uh, suggests that uh, the most uh, demanding, one of the most local, uh, demanding local content policies in the world anywhere, um, which um, Petrobras requested a relaxation of in March. Um, there's been lots of bottlenecks in the Brazilian service industry, uh, which led to a real inability to take advantage of the highest oil prices. Uh, in addition, um, Petrobras are limited by uh, fixed oil prices, uh, which, although they rose by 5% in March, um, Barclays Capital suggested that the refinery arm would need a further 25% rise uh, just to break even. Um, the lack of co um, refining capacity uh, meant that Petrobras were import um, importing oil at international prices and then having to sell it at a loss. So uh, there's been essentially as a publicly traded company, uh, they've been making uh, some losses. Uh, Petrobras has begun a divestment program uh, aiming to raise around $10 billion uh, for exploration uh, following a $70 billion <coughs> share if issue in 2010. Uh, this is aimed at providing cash for a five-year $237 billion investment plan focused on Brazilian exploration. Uh, however, due to a glut of available holdings in the Gulf of Mexico and a reduction in the value of their assets uh, in Brazil, which is a consequence of the upcoming uh, licensing round, which is focused around the uh, equatorial margin, uh, Petrobras has had to scale back targets on asset sales. Uh, the current debt equity ratio of Petrobras is, is fairly healthy, although uh, impending bond sales and loans uh, may mean this increases in the near future. Uh, so just to move on to uh, the actual licensing of the pre-salt area, the next bids are due to take place in late November. Uh, Petrobras is due to remain as operator, um, citing the experience of drilling in these challenging environments and uh, their related safety concerns. Uh, one of the highlights, as I alluded to earlier, is the Libra discovery, uh, which I'll show you an image of on the next slide, um, and the production sharing contact, uh, contract offered to companies is non-negotiable. So here we have just uh, a seismic line here uh, showing. We have in pink, we have the, uh, the salt layer, uh, and I suppose one of the most important parts here, which is the key uncertainty in the area, is the carbonate reservoir that we find in the post rift, uh, also known as the sag sequence. Uh, in the green, we have the sin rift, um, and then underlying, which is, quite, which is fairly fundamental, the, uh, the uplifted basement uh, with its uh, related fault block geometries uh, creating the, the structural traps below the, uh, the salt. Uh, so here we have a production curve from Petrobras. Um, the targets over the last three years has been relatively consistent, around 2 uh, million barrels of oil per day. However, in March of this year, the output was only 1.85 million barrels per day. Uh, the plan is to ramp up production from uh, 2013 to 2016 to around 2.5 uh, million barrels of oil a day. And then we can see a linear in increase from 2016 mm. to 2020 uh, to a significant increase in production. Uh, here we have um, Petrobras's planned total investments. So uh, here we can see uh, in the upstream section of uh, their budget, the green here, uh, as I mentioned with the transfer of rights, essentially just uh, refers to the pre-salt. Uh, so the pre-salt budget here uh, essentially adds up to about $80 billion. Um, which out of the 130 uh, represents uh, 130 billion dollars represents a, a sort of significant amount. So here's some statistics with regard to the pre-salt. Uh, we have a success ratio of 82%, uh, with 15 pre-salt discoveries in the last year or so. 
Um, in February this year, uh, a, rate, a major production target was hit for the first time, uh, producing 300,000 barrels of oil per day, uh, with 43% of that uh, coming from Santos and 57% from Campos. Um, and this was achieved with only 17 wells. Uh, the most impressive stat for me personally would be that this level of production was reached in just seven years, um, which taking into account the initial costs uh, of drilling in the pre-salt, as well as the, uh, the actual physical technical challenges, uh, makes that particularly impressive. So just uh, a brief uh, look at some of the pre-salt successes. Uh, BG Group, with, their, um, with acquiring pre-salt acreage, uh, prior to the discovery of Lula, means that they have since contributed total reserves and resources net to BG of uh, four to eight billion barrels of oil. Uh, we also have companies such as Repsol, Gallup Energy, um, but the one I really wanted to draw your attention to was the, uh, the rumoured takeover of Barra Energy uh, with China's uh, National Petroleum Corp rumoured to be in, <coughs> talks about a takeover at present. So now, uh, which is more my personal domain, we're going to get onto the, the geology of the pre-salt. Uh, so here we have, this is in essence the pre-salt play itself. Um, here we have this extensive salt, which is obviously why we call this the, the pre-salt. Um, it's an extensive and thick evaporite, which essentially provides a perfect seal uh, to the underlying geology. Uh, this post-rift here, uh, made up of carbonates, uh, also referred to as a SAG sequence, um, is it's referred to here as a non-marine carbonate as uh, the exact definition isn't exactly clear. Uh, we could be talking about microbialites, we could be talking about travertines, we could be talking about a bit of both, but essentially the debate still rages. Uh, below this we have the Sinris section um, with prolific source rocks equivalent to the Lagoya Fea in the Campos Basin. And then we have the underlying uh, geometry of the basement, uh, the, the high of which is what creates the outer high of the Santos Basin. And we're seeing these uh, rotated fault block geometries which create the accommodation space for the sin rift and the onlap of the overlying sag sequence. So here we can see uh, the whole of the uh, Sugarloaf High here. Um, and just to give you a sense of scale, this survey, uh, which is the cluster and cluster extension, is uh, just over 42,000 square kilometres. So it's a pretty massive structure. <coughs> Uh, so just to go over again, why is the pre-salt so attractive? Uh, well, we have this <coughs> extensive evaporite seal, as I mentioned, uh, these large structural highs, uh, which create a multitude of traps uh, below the salt layer over a massive area. We've got extensive and mature lacustrian source rock, uh, but I guess the, the key one that everyone's interested in is that we've got several proven billion barrel oil discoveries uh, with further discoveries under appraisal at present. However, as I briefly mentioned earlier, the key uh, to unlocking the full potential of the outer high, at least, is to, uh, to get an understanding of the distribution of reservoir fascias. So here we have an image uh, taken from the core of Lula. Uh, like I say, this is ex extensively debated, but I have interpreted that <coughs> we're seeing lateral accretion surf uh, surfaces akin to microbial mac deposits, as well as sphere lights in here, uh, which are creating really positive uh, poroperm <coughs> properties. Um, however, it looks like we're seeing some sort of infill porosity by possibly hydrothermal uh, fluids. Um, one of the key arguments for travertine deposits in the area is that we're getting uh, thick deposits of Stevensite uh, evaporites, which are usually found in association with hydrothermal fluids, uh, which is essentially how we'd be precipitating these travertines. So what exactly do we know about these carbonates? Um, the outer high of the Santos Basin is an extensive platform created by the uplift of the basement. <coughs> These carbonates are deposited in an increasingly saline uh, and restricted environment, uh, which, as we see, ultimately results in the deposition of the overlying evaporite sequence. Uh, we have a gradual transition from fossiliferous uh, Coquina limestone, where we're seeing sort of uh, before the onset of the increased salinity, uh, to as I say, we're either getting microbial or abiotic carbonates, but they certainly reflect <laughs> a, more, uh, a more restricted environment. The actual seismic itself seems to show a variety of seismic fasces, uh, allowing for an interpretation, at least, of the depositional setting. So I'm just going to show you a couple of these, a uh, couple of images from the seismic itself. So here we can see the Lula field again and the, uh, the well just through here, so the interpreted section. 
And like I say, the key here is that we've got the, uh, the on-lap of these, these carbonates up against this basement high, uh, providing a pinch shell up against the salt. Here we have the Sapinwa field. Uh, again, drilled through here. And it appears that we have some kind of transpressional structure which is leading to the uplift of the reservoir. Uh, I couldn't say for sure whether the uh, reservoir characteristics have been enhanced by this faulting, but we're certainly seeing somewhere where we can focus the migration of any oil up into this point, uh, creating this 2.1 billion barrel oil field of recoverable reserves. So specific features that I picked out uh, whilst I've been working on this particular area include uh, some build-ups that we see along the margin of the high, uh, these intriguing sort of morphologies just found along the edge here. Um, there's two ways I've, well, I'll get onto that in a sec, sorry. We've got um, some seismic here. The green represents undifferentiated basement and uh, cinric lithologies, and the pink over the top is the, uh, the salt. And we can see uh, some slight aggradational morphologies within the seismic as well, uh, which appear to show that these are as a result of some uh, build-out um, process. Uh, so here we have it in 3D as well. Uh, just along the margin, we're seeing these build-ups. And there's uh, two ways that you could potentially interpret this. Uh, the first, which I personally feel is the more feasible of the two, uh, that we're getting a fascist belt of uh, microbial-like deposition along the margin uh, here, and then we're seeing uh, the collapse of these microbial boundstone surfaces, uh, which is possibly shown here by uh, mass failure scarring, as well as... Um, down the redeposition of the carbonates as uh, some kind of debris flow. Uh, as an analog, uh, the Tengiz field of Kazakhstan uh, seems to show very similar seismic flashes to what we're seeing here. However, if we were looking at these as an abiotic pre uh, precipitate, we could use this, uh, which is the needles from Pyramid Lake in Nevada, as some kind of analog uh, where we'd be seeing uh, the abiotic precipitation of carbonates uh, as a result of uh, the flow of hydrothermal fluids. Uh, another key question with regards to the reservoir quality is uh, whether the platform itself is exclusively carbonate. Uh, the key area here is the, uh, this is where we're seeing the most extensive uplift of the basement uh, to the point where we're seeing no sedimentary cover whatsoever in this area here. Um, so from about this, this area around here, uh, we've got no sedimentary cover whatsoever. We've just got purely basement. Uh, and then we're seeing some uh, truncation of synriff reflectors up here. And the key feature I want to draw your attention to are these uh, clinoforms just in here, uh, which appear to be prograding out from this area here. It's also worth pointing out that over here is the main depot center uh, of the drainage basin of the high. Uh, so this uh, almost certainly represents some kind of uh, deeper lake margin. Uh, so here, just a more of a close-up here. Uh, the green here represents the base of the, the sag phase or the post roof, and the blue here represents the base of the salt. Uh, so one possible model is that we're seeing uh, some kind of prograding carbonate here. Uh, this here represents the, uh, the uplifted basement, and this here represents the aclina forms. So to start with, we've got extensive uh, continental lakes, uh, as well as an absence of clastic input. Uh, which is resulting in widespread carbonate deposition. Um, as a result, we're seeing uh, high energy and or photic carbonate deposition on the margin of the lake, um, which is um, being precipitated at a higher rate than anywhere else uh, on the high itself. As the uh, lake level begins to recede, um, we're seeing more arid conditions uh, and we're beginning to see the, the movement from carbonates to evaporites. Um, and as we can see, the lake level is falling, and these clinoforms are merely keeping pace with uh, the fall of this lake level. Until we start to see extensive evaporites uh, being deposited on the high, um, we're still seeing this progradation, and due to the fact that this represents possibly some kind of drainage basin, uh, this is the, where we're going to see the last remaining waters on the high, uh, so we're seeing a continued progradation in line with that. So what would the implications for fasci's distribution be here? Um, I would suggest that these prograts may, uh, in this case, be quite an attractive exploration target. Um, I would make a further interpretation as to the nature of carbonates we might expect here. Um, if the species are dependent on the photic zone, and whilst we have to make allowances for the saline nature of the waters on 
on the high. Uh, we might usually suggest some kind of reef building species or uh, banks of mollusks like you see on the Cochrane <coughs> limestones in the Campos Basin. Uh, however, in this particular example, I'd be more inclined to suggest that we've got some sort of photosynthetic microbes uh, which are resulting in a microbially induced or controlled fabric. Uh, however, if the higher energy conditions uh, are the reason we're seeing these carbonates deposited here, uh, we might expect some kind of elytic grainstone or rudstone fascias, although, again, here, uh, this would be a favourable environment for microbes due to the uh, increased nutrient supply. Another interpretation that we might make here is that these clinoforms are actually sourced from the basement and the truncated synrift up here, and they've got nothing to do with carbonates at all. So this, the purpose of this interpretation here is just to show that we've got a relatively consistent thickness on these synrift packages uh, that seem to be abruptly uh, truncated at the base of salt level. Uh, this would mean that we've got significant uh, provenance of sediment that could be being redeposited downslope here, as well as uh, a significant input of sediment from the top of the high. So this would be a model for an alluvial fan, uh, fasces uh, for, the, for this particular area. So again, we've got this exposed high, but instead of carbonates, we're merely seeing that the, uh, the sediment here, the detrital sediment, is being sourced from the high itself, as well as the, uh, the synrif lithologies. Uh, in which case, I would suggest that the clinoforms here would possibly represent a slightly less attractive exploration target. Um, we're likely, in reality, to have a, a combination of clastics and carbonates, uh, which is unlikely to result in a conventional high-quality reservoir. However, if carbonate input is minimal, we might find <coughs> that we've got a quartz-rich uh, reservoir which would open up a new kind of, kind of play not seen anywhere else on the high. So just to sort of uh, finish off here, I just wanted to show you this slide uh, which represents we're seeing a series of tilted basement fault blocks here and a significant thickness of uh, sag sequence uh, reservoir uh, potential here which eventually thins out against the basement as some kind of pinch out. So I mean this is an area which has been barely even looked at, it's not been drilled, it's not been listed as a prospect but We've got a series of tilted fault blocks which may or may not yield some sort of uh, exploration potential. Uh, with the ever sort of decreasing pr uh, prices of drilling wells, uh, areas like this may be, may be drilled at some point in the future. So uh, just to briefly look on the, uh, the future of the pre-salt Santos Basin, uh, which as rightly identified by the current president of Brazil, um, <coughs> could well be uh, a very profitable uh, endeavour for Brazil. So the key questions, I suppose, uh, some will revolve around uh, the future of Petrobras. Uh, however, one thing we can say for certain is that with the transfer of rights agreement, there's likely to be uh, quite a few prospects uh, coming back onto the market. Uh, the low resource estimate of Franco, which is held within the transfer of rights, uh, is estimated as a low estimate of 14.5 billion barrels of oil. Uh, with the transfer of rights, um, the limit of oil production is 5 billion barrels, so it seems likely that several uh, prospects identified by Petrobras, as well as AMP, which is the, uh, the government organisation, uh, there will be lots of prospects and potential for, for companies in the area in the near future. Uh, Libra seems to have gone slightly under the radar with some of the other discoveries made in the, uh, the area. The slide I showed you earlier uh, was over an extent of 45 kilometres um, and it was drilled on one of the lower points of that 45 kilometres and that showed 326.4 uh, metres of net pay. Um, so if you've got good quality uh, and a well-connected reservoir, we could be talking about a massive discovery here in the near future. Um, the the possible reserves in the pre-salt have been estimated to be as much as 123 billion barrels of oil, which admittedly is a bit optimistic. A more sensible uh, estimation would probably be somewhere in the region of about 50 billion barrels of oil. But as of 2012, proven reserves were 14 billion barrels, so there's some way to go either way, and it looks like the, uh, the story of the Santos Basin is just beginning. Uh, this here, if you're interested, is, is President Lula, as you can see from his name badge, and that is um, when first oil was produced from what was then the Tupi field. That's it, thank you. Okay, any, uh, any questions, James?
If not, no, I, I mean, obviously the geology is fantastic and quite different. Uh, as you say, the, the pre-salt carbonates are quite a different species. Um, but the other aspect of this is, aren't the terms really, really terrible? And AMP has tipped the playing field in the direction of Petrobras so far that the, there's only one thing worse than losing acreage in Brazil, and that's actually winning it. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, the, the, the whole thing seems uneven and unrealistic. Now, I'm sure the license round will attract 50, 60, 70 companies, but it, isn't it actually, you know, the worst term and the most tilted, you know, if you were playing football on this field, you would never keep the ball on the pitch. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that's interesting with uh, Petrobras at the moment is that... Uh, step closer to the mic. Sorry. Uh, yeah, one of the things that's interesting with Petrobras at the moment is their current president has said that uh, in the next licensing round for the uh, equatorial blocks, they'll be looking to be a lot more selective about the blocks they go into. So where Petrobras was operating with virtually everything in Brazil, uh, at this point they're looking to say, well, we do have a limited budget essentially, and... Uh, it looks like they're, um, they're going to be a lot more selective, which may open up some uh, opportunities for other companies. Although, granted, the local content policies, particularly onshore, uh, could be crippling for certain companies. But uh, I still think there's potential. And if there's obviously, there's been so, man, so much demand for um, being approved for the, uh, the licensing round. I think there's 64 companies now have been approved on that list. So clearly there's demand. So there must be some sort of economic rationale behind that. Okay, anybody else?